everyone. I'm Audrey Coleman, Associate Director and Director of Museum and Archives at the Dole Institute of Politics. Thanks for joining us for our new installment of our digital series, Living History. And I'm so pleased that the Director of Museums and Education at the Kansas Historical Society, Mary Madden, can join us today to talk about their current exhibit, Upward to Equality, Kansas Women Fight to Vote. Mary, thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Glad to talk about it. <laughs> so what makes this exhibit so timely this year? Well, it is a 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Um, and so lots of museums jumped on this uh, wagon train. And there have been a number of exhibits. It is also the 150th anniversary of the passage of the 15th Amendment. So we do pay homage to that as well. So Kansas led the, led the charge in many ways. What, what did Kansas women do um, for, in the very initial stages of the fight for women's suffrage? Well, you know, that's a good question. And I don't think most people realize how important Kansas was on the national level so early on. Um, it was in the 1850s during the territorial period, there were abolitionists coming out here to fight against slavery. But those families and the women were also fighting for suffrage. And so uh, an early example is Clarina Nichols. Uh, she lobbied at the Wyandotte Constitution. Um, she couldn't speak or you know, all the delegates were men, but she lobbied and in the Wyandotte Constitution under which we became a state, uh, women got the right to um, uh, own property, um, have regulations, rights over their children, and to be able to vote in school district elections. And we are first in the nation. And as a result of that, um, we got the attention of suffragists back east, and a lot of people saw Kansas as the first viable opportunity for a state to pass a constitutional amendment for universal suffrage, which is just what we tried to do in 1867, so just two years after the Civil War. So this year, I think we kind of shined a light this year on just how complicated of a political process it was for women to gain suffrage. I mean, they had to build coalitions across political parties and interest groups. Could you tell us a little bit about those challenges? Yes, it definitely was politics. Um, and uh, a lot of women themselves didn't want the vote. They thought only bad women would vote or that um, their place was in the home. So it wasn't just men um, trying to keep women out of politics. So. Uh, the women over the course of the number of elections that took place, both for uh, amendments or, or bills in the legislature and constitutional amendments, um, involved aligning with different parties. And one of the um, more successful one before full suffrage was in the 1880s when uh, 1881 Kansas was the first state to constitutionally outlaw alcohol. And four years later, when the next governor came in, Governor Glick, who was a Democrat, uh, he thought that law was a little too strict and only benefited the bootleggers. So he was willing to back down. Well, the women at that time saw an opportunity to uh, align with the Republicans who wanted to ban alcohol. And as you know, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, Carrie Nation, all of that is part of our, our history. And so they reached a compromise with the Republicans in the legislature to give women the right to vote in city or municipal elections. And there we are. We're the first in the nation to have that. Uh, we had the first woman mayor in the nation, Susanna Salter from Argonia, and we had the first uh, city, all-female city council in Syracuse, same year. So this political process this, of this project of gaining suffrage and even getting the vote um, to, to Congress took many decades. Uh, how, how long did that take and, and how, how long did these women have to, to work to achieve their success? Yeah. Unfortunately, some who started did not see the end results. Uh, so suffrage, the suffrage movement in Kansas started in 1854 with uh, the territorial period and went through 1912. So you have a series of, of movements and different women taking leadership and involved from uh, national leaders in all of our attempts for amendments or for um, 
a bill. Um, so it wasn't until 1912, and that's the, the progressive era, and the stars were kind of aligned because uh, the woman leading the movement, Lucy Johnston, um, was uh, lobbying heavily to all legislators and not just looking for one party affiliation. Her husband happened to be Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court, and Governor Stubbs was in favor of it. Um, so uh, then all it came down to was getting the amendment voted on by the citizens. So, and that happened in 1912. But um, lots of different attempts and lots of, lots of work. Uh, it really was a fight. Mm -hmm. you know, um, it wasn't, they were not, no one was ever given the right to vote. They fought for it. Mm -hmm. Well, even after women gain suffrage, we're still progressing and, and fighting for equality in other ways. And so, you know, once, once the women of Kansas got suffrage within the state, they still kept working. And what were some of the other things that they yeah, continued they to did. do? Um, they had cut their teeth here and they, a number of them were very willing to uh, work back east because the suffrage um, a movement really, it was the western states that adopted the amendment uh, first and so it was the east and the south that had to be convinced. And so women went to um, the White House um, under Alice Paul, uh, people took on hunger strikes and two Kansas connections there, um, Nita Allender, who is um, a famous cartoonist for the women's suffrage movement, she's from Auburn, Kansas. And she actually designed the first, or the suffrage pin. It's a little um, jail door with a heart locket on it. And um, that was given to women who underwent the hunger strikes. Um, and one woman in Kansas, Effie Boutwell, she's the only woman in Kansas who received that pin. So uh, they were those um, fighting in Alice Paul's camp, which was more militant, and then others working directly for Carrie Chapman Cat. Um, and uh, there was a, a woman, Annie Griggs, down in Garnett, and she wrote and was uh, lobbied all over the Midwest and was a good friend of Kat. And so a lot of Kansas women working on the national scene. The Kansas women even influenced the, the colors of the movement. Is that yes, right? <laughs> yes. That was in 18, the 1880s too, when women got the right to vote for um, in city elections, uh, national took such attention and they decided to honor the Kansas sunflower and make the color yellow, the color of suffrage, because we were such leaders and reformers. That's so cool that we have that own state claim to that. Yeah. So in the process of turning this story into an exhibit, um, did you come across any surprises within your collections or, or what are some of your favorite things on display that visitors who come to the exhibit might yeah. see? Well, you know, one of the things when you're talking about politics, and you talk about it a lot, <laughs> it's hard to find artifacts sometimes that aren't just two-dimensional. Um, and so we, we have a lot of pictures and we have a lot of documents and like that, posters. Um, but um, we have, um, well, Carrie Nation's dress, because she is famously quoted as, if you had given... You, you refused me the right to vote, so I had to pick up a rock. You know, that led to her smashing. Um, we have her hatchet. And then we have kind of a, this kind of fed to our collection when we were working on the exhibit. Um, a woman back east sent us her grandmother's dress. And this woman uh, was active in suffrage. And so the women are allowed to vote in 1912 in Kansas. And so the next major election is 1914, and she wears the height of fashion, a hobble skirt to vote. And she walks down to the election place, a polling place, votes. And you know, hobble skirts are real tight at the ankles. Uh, weren't popular really long, but then she couldn't walk back uphill because <laughs> her skirt was so tight. So she had to get a ride home. But she is um, mentioned a lot in the exhibit because she, she left uh, her writings and talked about that it was uh, such a, a privilege to vote. Writing is a privilege and no one should not take advantage of it. So kind of one of our heroes. This exhibit 
I think along with many of us just went on display right before the, the pandemic started and can visit oh, yeah. come to the to the historical society to see it today. Are, are you available? Um, unfortunately, no. Um, March 20th was our opening date and that was the beginning of, of the end <laughs> for the museum being open and um, it will stay up. We are not going to take it down. We're going to keep it up. We hope to have it open yet this year because it is the anniversary year. Uh, we have also published a catalog and that is available online. Um, we will ship it to you for free or you can download it. Um, and then we're also doing a virtual tour which should be ready next week, about 60 minute virtual tour of the exhibit. But you still want to come out and see the exhibit because we have this great little game we came up with. So the game is, who am I in the fight for suffrage? And by answering a series of seven questions, you find out how you would have, um, how you would have led the movement or where you, you would have campaigned. Uh, would you have done it locally? You know, would you have written about it? Would you have um, lectured? And so it, it just gives you another little um, way to focus on these, these 16 people. Um, who worked for and against suffrage. Mm -hmm. So hopefully people get to play the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that strikes me as a great way to, to really internalize and make personal the, the stories and, and find out what, what your role might have been. Mm -hmm. well, which one are you? Oh, I, you know, I've tried so many basically to see if it works. <laughs> the one you don't want to be is Marsh Murdoch because he was the uh, publisher of the Wichita Eagle, and he was really against women's rights. And, um, he said a lot of nasty things, so you don't want to be him. <laughs> Does he appear in the exhibit? Oh, yeah. Um, just like uh, every political issue, there's pros and cons, and he was the one who was really pushing that uh, women would become too masculine. Um, great posters of men being forced to stay home while their women go out to vote. You know, all these extreme things that um, people used to try and prejudice you against something that in this case really wasn't a bad thing. <laughs> it really is important in a democracy to have all people be able to vote. And that was one of the things too in, in, with this uh, exhibit is um, very sad to see the element of segregation and discrimination, um, that there was a colored line between black suffragists and, and white um, and excluding them uh, from main platforms, but yet um, resilient. There are a number of black suffragists who campaigned in Kansas, um, Langston Hughes' mother, for example, and his grandfather. Um, so out of adversity, there is still strength and uh, working towards everyone getting uh, equal rights. And it wasn't until the Civil Rights Voting Act of 1865 that really Blacks were enfranchised, which is um, part of our history, but it's a very sad part of our history. Well, as, as you've mentioned, it shows that it takes our country decades to change uh, and lots of work, but, but we can change. So that's yes. one thing to keep in mind if we set our mind to it. That's the good news. Mm -hmm. Yes, and everyone should go out and vote in November. It is a privilege. You mentioned that you're going to have a, a virtual uh, exhibit coming out in the, in the next few weeks. Where, how would we access that if somebody wanted to see it? Um, it's on our YouTube video, our YouTube channel. So kshs.org is our website. And you can just look at the icon on the um, bottom edge of the screen to all our YouTubes. And so you will see it there. Wonderful. Well, I hope all of our viewers will take the opportunity to see the exhibit virtually and then we'll hold out hope um, for when the Historical Society opens again and you can come see it in person. It sounds like a wonderful uh, presentation and one that we can all learn a lot from and get a lot of perspective from. I'll wel e welcome each and every one of you personally. I'm very eager to get the museum back open. It's, um, it's a great resource and it's uh, something that, although I'm passionate about Kansas history, 
I hope other people will come and see something that sparks their interest um, about the state that they hadn't known before. Thanks for being with us today, Mary, and thanks for all your hard work and all the work you do for our state. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for this installment of Living History, and we will see you again virtually very soon. Take care.